Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Anzina Marari. I am a program officer with the Rasmussen Foundation and a practicing artist. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Tristan Agnarak Morgan, to welcome us to tonight's program. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Tristan Agnarak Morgan. Uvanga Agnarak Sagavan Koyak. Nagavana Koyak. My apologies. Olavinaga my name is Tristan Aganark Morgan. I am a program fellow here at Rasmussen Foundation, and I'm going to start us off by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, so, as many of you guys know, as many of you know, uh, Rasmussen does reside in Anchorage, Alaska, traditionally Denina Atlanta, Denina Athabaskan land. Um, the native village of Akutna is just uh, north of Anchorage. So, I just wanted to give a special thank you, Koyanakbuk, to the Denia Athabaskan people for allowing us to gather on their land today and to take a minute to thank the original stewards of whatever land you are on if you are not currently uh, in the Anchorage area. So, thank you so much for coming tonight, and I'll go on and pass it on to Anzina. Thank you so much, Tristan. Um, again, uh, my name is Anzina, and uh, we are also lucky to be sharing this virtual space with you this evening. Uh, before we get started, we did want to do uh, a round of introductions and recognize and honor the time of uh, Rasmussen Foundation staff who are on the call. Uh, tonight, we are joined by uh, Karen Lowell, who is a contract program support to the Individual Artist Awards and does a lot of the one-on-one -on -one artist contact. Uh, if you have reached out to us at arts at rasmussen.org, Karen is likely your first point of contact. We're also joined by Zuli Mason, who is also a program support for the Individual Artist Awards program. Lisa Deemer, our communications manager that does all of our wonderful uh, messaging along with uh, Emily Kwan, who is our external affairs associate, uh, along with Lisa manages a lot of those aspects. And Nicholas Conrad, who is our IT consultant. And without him, we would often be led astray. Um, before we start, I also wanted to acknowledge with sincere gratitude our co-hosts on the call tonight. Uh, our co-hosts include Adele Pearson with the Bunnell Street Arts Center in Homer, Alaska, Jess Pena with the Fairbanks Arts Association, Reggie Schaap with the Juno Arts and Humanities Council, Kathleen Light and Katie Posey with the Ketchikan Arts Area Arts and Humanities Council, uh, Marlise Lee with Kodiak Historical Society and uh, Kodiak History Museum, Carrie Hahn with the Nome Arts Council, and Sam Dingus with the Palmer Museum of History and Art. Uh, we are so grateful for their partnership in this program. We are also joined uh, by Hollis Mickey with the Anchorage Museum and Andrea Noble, the Executive Director at the Alaska State Council on the Arts. Uh, and I do wanna ask Hollis and Andrea to speak for just a moment uh, about their work uh, within arts and in partnership with the foundation. Um, Hollis, can I bounce it to you uh, to start? Of course, thank you, Anzina. Um, and welcome everyone to this evening. Uh, it's such a pleasure to get to join you all um, for this important informational workshop at the Anchorage Museum. I'm the Chief Learning and Access Officer, which means that I run the Education Department. And part of my work has been over the past couple of years developing artist professional development along with the Rasmussen um, Foundation uh, for Individual Artist Award winners. So um, those who are recipients of the awards um, will have the opportunity to engage in workshops uh, and be led towards furthering their careers. Um, and we're developing some really exciting new models to address um, things that have come up here with COVID-19, but also to make the program more accessible um, for this coming year of awardees. Thank you so much, Hollis. And thank you for your partnership uh, the last few years uh, with providing artist support and resources. Andrea, uh, can I pass it to you? Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you tonight. 
Um, I'm starved for social interaction, so I'm really excited to see so many of you on the call. Um, the Alaska State Council on the Arts is a statewide arts agency, and we're also a public corporation with foundation partners. Um, we're engaged in strategic community arts and education investments, as well as cultural policy and economic development opportunities for artists, makers, and creative producers in Alaska. So our longstanding partnership with Rasmussen Foundation began in 2004, when the foundation approached the council to administer $120,000 in grant funds to support the foundation's arts education initiatives. And those have really grown in the past 17 years. Um, through this partnership, Rasmussen Foundation has supported arts and education grants, Harper Arts Touring Grants, and Youth and Cultural Heritage Grants and activities. So most recently, um, this is pretty exciting. Um, in uh, the pandemic um, age, uh, the partnership focused on leveraging private and public funds for pandemic emergency relief and recovery through the Arts and Culture Emergency Relief Grant that was administered uh, through Alaska Arts and Culture Foundation. Then that led also to the Adaptation and Innovation Grant Program that was developed in partnership with the foundation. Um, and the application for that is actually open on our website right now. And I notice I'm not able to access the chat box, but the website is quite simple. It's ak.arts.gov. And later I can add that in Xena um, if you wanted to open it up and I can put that in there for everybody. Great, thank you so Thanks. much, Andrea. And uh, again, extreme gratitude for all of the co-hosts on the call and for your stewardship of arts and culture throughout Alaska and your uh, dedicated to support to artists and creatives across the state. So some guidelines uh, to help uh, guide us through this presentation this evening. The presentation will be in two parts. Part one uh, will begin shortly and that is the information and program orientation session. Uh, we'll pause after that for a few minutes and then come back together for a hands-on workshop. Uh, we do wanna encourage you at this time, you uh, can keep your camera on or off to your comfort level. We ask that you keep your mic muted and any questions that come up, we ask that you put them in the chat and we are, will do our best to run through those questions uh, when we get to the Q&A session at the end of each segment of the presentation. There's a lot of folks on this call tonight and we're so excited. We will likely not be able to get to all questions this evening. We will be keeping track of the chat. And if your question does not get answered, we encourage you to email arts at rasmussen.org. And if folks are not familiar with how to uh, access chat, if you scroll over more, the three dots that say more, more on your um, uh, bar, you will see the chat box and you can uh, enter uh, to, uh, uh, any comments or questions there. And just make sure that it's clicked on everyone. Otherwise, you might end up accidentally privately messaging someone. All right. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. So we're going to do a quick swap here and we will begin the presentation. You Just a quick acknowledgement of uh, the music that brought us in today was by local Alaska musician, Famua. So uh, as I mentioned, this presentation has two parts. The first part is the foundation history, real brief history of the foundation and overview of the individual artist award program. And then around 6.30, we will begin the workshop. So if you're logged on now and you've already attended an info session, this first part will be largely duplicative, so you're welcome to check out and check back on in 630 if you are only interested in the workshop portion. Oops, apologies. Okay, it looks like I lost control of the Zoom for a moment there. Um, so we just wanted to touch on the type of outreach 
um, that we're engaging with this year. Um, so every year we look at the program and do an assessment about how we can do better, reach more artists and better represent um, the wealth and depth of art making in Alaska. And we've noticed that there, are, there were several underrepresented groups and disciplines and regions. And so this year we've uh, established a lot of partnerships with groups uh, that have been typically underrepresented and, and thus unserved by the program. So we've partnered with Enlaces Alaska to reach the Latinx community. We partnered with Black Alaska Arts Matters to learn about ways we can be uh, more um, uh, uh, open and uh, recognizing of different uh, ways of making. Uh, we've partnered with Alaska Heritage Center and are partnering with uh, several entities across the state in an effort to um, encourage applications and with the outcome of the awards, better representing the broad diversity of Alaskans. And through those conversations we've been having, we've learned a lot about the different challenges, strengths, and needs that artists in several communities face. And Tristan, uh, if you can speak a little bit to that, um, I'll pass it over to you. Oh, so a lot of the, the challenges we, we were aware of before, but it was really interesting and amazing to really hear from artists themselves and creatives who uh, have a lot of issues with accessing the individual artist awards and grants in general. So a lot of we, we see a lot of um, artists not even seeing themselves as artists to begin with when they've been practicing a craft for a really long time or they are just not well versed within the fine art sector, which is extremely understandable. So by in having these informational meetings and these conversations, we've um, seen a lot of creatives not seeing themselves as artists. Um, and all, honestly, uh, Rasmussen hasn't built a level of trust with specifically Black and Indigenous and people of color um, and those communities and how we need to build that level of trust in between um, us and the artists. And then also a uh, barrier, a language barrier. We're hearing a lot of, of language barriers for the application process. And um, so we are trying to provide as much support as we can this year, uh, but by hearing the challenges and strengths and needs, uh, we are really able to um, hone in on what we can do better for the next year and the years to come. And Zena, did you wanna add anything to that? Thanks, Tristan. Um, you know, we want to hear from you on the call as well, and we know we don't have enough time uh, to engage in a, 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 a good, thorough conversation, but we do ask you to put in the chat the different challenges and strengths and needs that you've experienced, um, and we want to uh, we want to uh, reinforce that we are accessible uh, to you and to answer your questions. And last year we brought on contract support specifically to provide one-on-one -on -one support to artists who are applying for the awards. Thanks, Tristan. So real brief intro into the history of the Rasmussen Foundation. The roots of the foundation can really be traced back to Yakutat, Alaska, where Jenny Olson a Swedish immigrant traveled uh, as a missionary and there met her husband E.A., who was also a Swedish immigrant who had traveled to be a teacher. Um, there they had their son Elmer. Uh, the family went on into banking, which is what established a lot of the uh, fortune of the Rasmussen Fen uh, Foundation that began. Um, sorry, I was uh, muted there. Uh, we ask for some patience and grace as we uh, manage this process. Um, so again, the roots of investment in the arts uh, run deep uh, in Alaska. And uh, some of that, the earliest investments uh, can be seen in uh, Elmer Rasmussen supporting uh, the maintenance of arts and uh, Alaska Native Arts and Artifacts Remaining in Alaska. Um, uh, he uh, would often buy works directly from artists uh, and created a collection when he noticed that lots of out-of-town folks were buying arts, Alaska Native and Indigenous Arts and Artifacts, art, um, artifacts and taking them out of state. Um, and in 2000, uh, uh, the Rasmussen Foundation invested uh, in an initiative for arts and culture. And I'll pass it to Tristan to speak a little bit more about that. 
So the initiative was uh, implemented in 2004 to reinvest in arts and culture in Alaska on a statewide level. And it was really to help individual artists. And we see uh, uh, the individual, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm getting distracted. Um, the 2004 initiative and to help individual artists and then also to uh, expand that and help organizations like nonprofits and then at an, a statewide community level um, like Council on the Arts. So working closely with Council on the Arts and the other entities where we can uh, really reinvest in arts and culture in Alaska at all of those various levels. Thank you, Tristan. Um, and to expand on that, in 2004, uh, the board uh, uh, committed to investing in arts and culture, and they realized that the best way to in invest in arts and culture in a broad way was to put money directly in the hands of individual artists. And this is what began the Individual Artist Awards program. Um, uh, Tristan, would you define some of the purpose of the program? So it's really to allow for dedicated time and resources for serious artistic exploration and growth, and that's over a year long period. And we wanted to really strengthen Alaska's cultural resources. So since it was incepted in 2004, the program has provided over 550 grants to artists mm -hmm. and representing more than 50 communities throughout Alaska. And the three awards that we'll be talking about are the Distinguished Artist Awards and then the Project Awards and Fellowship, which is going to be the primary focus that we're going to be on today. Thank you so much, Tristan. And just real quick, wanted to give a shout out to Lily Hope, who is the creator of the past award necklaces. So um, keeping that award even in house for all of the award recipients here in Alaska. The fellowship award, $18,000. There are 10 unrestricted grants for a short-term project over a year long. The project award, which is a smaller grant at 7,500. Those are 25 grants. So it's a little less competitive than fellowship. That's for a short-term project. And then the Distinguished Artist Award, which is a $40,000 one grant and selected by nomination. That's separate, completely separate from the Fellowship Award and the Project Award, even has a complete separate panel process. Um, so that is actually still in, is in the works currently. Uh, so that time to nominate a Distinguished Artist has already passed, but we ask that if there are, are any community members that you know of that deserve recognition that have created be that have been creating art for decades um, that you nominate them in November of this year for the following year. And the and artist the career stages are emerging, emerging mid-career, mid and, and mature. So the so emerging and, and mid-career and mature are available, are available for project awards, awards but, but the, the mid-career and mature are only available, available for the fellowship. And we're currently, and we're currently in the middle of the application period and the application closes at, on March 1st. And real quick, we just wanted to do a shout out to some of the award recipients from last year. Uh, these 10 are the 2021 fellowships. Uh, we didn't have the space. Um, we didn't have the space to recognize all of the project award recipients, but we did want to uh, acknowledge uh, and give a little bit of room uh, to the artists that received fellowships last year. We also just wanted to give a really quick snapshot into what the application submissions looked like for project awards and for fellowships in 2020. And this gives a little bit of framework into why we are reaching out to specific disciplines that have been underrepresented. So you can see here that uh, the applicant pool weighs heavy on visual arts. Uh, and next is literary arts and script works and music composition. And that's pretty consistent. It's been that way for the last few years. And there are very few applications uh, from specific disciplines like choreography. We only received three total out of uh, nearly 300 applications. And we know more, that there are more than three brilliant dance artists in the state of Alaska, but um, only three applied. Um, and that's uh, that carries tr through um, to the fellowships, uh, which uh, Tristan had mentioned were, were uh, for mid-career or mature artists. So part of our strategy with outreach this year is to encourage uh, 
individuals outside of some of the uh, uh, disciplines like visual arts or music uh, to really see themselves in this program and to see themselves as eligible to receive these awards. So just diving a little bit deeper into the project award and fellowships, as Tristan noted, these are the two that are eligible for you to apply this year. The project award is the smaller of the two. It is a $7,500 award available to all disciplines. Uh, the foundation has identified 11 that an artist needs to self-select, uh, but those really are broad and diverse and uh, cover all uh, uh, spectrums of creative practice and art making, and therefore a project or activity that can occur within a one year period of time. We are going to be flexible with that one year period this year. We were last year, we, we are all living in an uncertain time. Um, so we encourage folks to think about projects that can be achieved within these unpredictable times we're living in. Um, and to, to think about that concept of adaptation and innovation that Andrea spoke about at the very beginning. The $7,500 uh, award is a set amount. So the project budget needs to reflect that. Um, someone cannot apply for fewer than $7,500. And that project budget we know is an estimate. Um, and if you have questions about what could be considered eligible in the budget, we really encourage you again to reach out to Karen at Arts at Rasmussen. And there are 25 project awards awarded each year. Fellowships are, as Tristan mentioned, uh, the uh, uh, awards available to mid-career or mature artists, and those are $18,000. They're a bit more unrestricted. So an artist still needs to propose a concept, but it can be really any type of undertaking that allows them to uh, propel or catapult their career even further. There are 10 fellowships awarded each year, which means that uh, within this competitive program, uh, the fellowships are even more competitive. Uh, again, I noted last year we had about 300 applications and only 35 uh, total awards. And the fellowships are not available to every discipline every year. They are only available to half of those disciplines. And this year, those disciplines are choreography, crafts, folk and traditional arts, literary arts, uh, script works, and performance arts. And Tristan is going to take us through uh, the rest of those disciplines. So here's a really good snapshot of all of the 11 artistic disciplines. As Nzina said, the top five are the only ones available for fellowships, and that switches each year. So next year, media arts, multidiscipline, music composition, new genre, presentation, and visual arts will all be available for a fellowship next year. Um, and we understand that these 11 disciplines can overlap and can kind of blend in with each other. And uh, so it's just really important to look at the guidelines and read through the description for each artistic discipline and really um, look at your project and see where you fit in best. So it is up to the artist in order to pick which artistic discipline they can um, apply in. And it's only one per year per individual or group. And um, yeah, was there anything that you wanted to add in Zina onto artistic discipline portion? I don't think so. Um, uh, just that again, there is a lot of overlap um, in, uh, in a discipline and we know that artists work across disciplines. Uh, we do have that multidiscipline category there for artists that that's work might be exploratory or that might involve several different types of making uh, uh, at one time. And so if you're not sure again about your discipline, reach out to us and we'll, uh, we'll help you with that process. Okay, so the other note we wanted to make, and this was a new change that we implemented last year, largely from feedback. And so again, we encourage you to let us know in the chat what those challenges, needs, strengths, weaknesses are, uh, and, and we take that into consideration. And so last year, we expanded the program to be eligible to groups and collaboratives. Historically, it has only been individuals who could apply. 
And we recognize that that is not honoring or mindful of the collaborative nature of the arts and arts practice. And so uh, last year was our first year implementing this and we're going to carry it forward. Uh, anyone who is part of a group or collaborative or collective uh, that is either working on a short-term project or a long-term project, it can look like a dance group that has been uh, in practice together for 10 years. It can look like a multidiscipline collective of a visual artist, a literary artist, and a performance artist coming together for one project and then dissolving. So really it's two or more artists uh, who are applying under one application. What's important to note is that uh, someone cannot apply for more than one award. So if someone is applying as an individual, they cannot also apply as a group or collective. And there are some specific guidelines around groups or collectives. So as Tristan mentioned, we encourage you to check out the guidelines that are available available online. You can download them or print them out uh, and, and read thoroughly the um, guidelines around groups and collaboratives and reach out to us and let us know if you have any questions uh, at all or need some clarity. Uh, and Tristan will talk us through some of the eligibility and criteria. Well, so for eligibility, you do need to be an Alaska resident for at least two years, similar to how the PFD is set up remain a, a resident for the duration of the grant and be an adult, as well as currently producing work. Currently producing work doesn't mean that you have to be a full-time artist, just that you have work within the last five years and, and you've been practicing. Um, the people that, or the individuals that are not eligible are going to be individuals that are enrolled in any degree seeking program related to the arts and or have artwork that is that was completed or um, is being completed while being enrolled in the degree seeking program. So if you are a recent graduate and your work samples only reflect your time while you're in that degree seeking program, you will not be able to utilize any of those work samples. And work cannot be primarily of research, scholarly or commercial nature and Zena will expand on that in a second. And this is also not a need based grant. So we understand that there are, there's a lot of need uh, for artists right now and especially um, in various art forms. And uh, we understand that there's, there's a high need that is not being met. Um, and the individual artist award is not an individual, is not a needs-based grant. So this is a yearly grant that we, yearly grants that we provide. And the criteria is the same criteria that we're, that we give to the panel, which in, and Zena will also go over in a second. And it's the artistic quality given the experience. So, um, if you're an emerging artist, we're not gonna compare your fellowship application to a mature artist. Um, we, it will just be based off of your application. The creative accomplishments that you have um, seen through your career, we understand that that looks different to each artist as well, and we'll provide some more feedback later. The impact on your growth as an artist, how is this going to help you? How is this going to, to push you forward in your practice? And then also the completeness of the application. So we do uh, have some, some points to talk about for the completeness of application and, and how we can help you with that. Um, but we want to ensure that your resume, your artist statement, everything kind of matches up and makes sense as a whole. Uh, and Zina? Fantastic, thank you so much, Tristan. Yeah, just to know what about the commercial nature, we get a lot of questions about this. And so we wanna provide a little bit of clarity. We know that artists need to make an income and often sell their work or reproduce their work in order to do so. So we don't see uh, making an album and selling that album as commercial. We don't see making prints of a painting and selling those paintings at, as commercial. What commercial means in this context for, for the purposes of this uh, award program is for instance, and this is the best example that I give, uh, there's a graphic design artist uh, that is an eligible art form, but that graphic design artist works for a design firm. They're using work samples that uh, were done under their contract at the design for firm and were logos for businesses or advertisements and are applying for equipment uh, for the design business uh, to produce higher quality work for their clients. So it's not advancing their practice as a graphic designer. It would be benefiting the business, the design firm that is working commercially. 
So if an artist is working to benefit their practice, they absolutely could buy equipment to support that or to be able to cut albums or make prints. But it's really work that's rooted in, in business and not the, the growth of the artist or the growth of the collective. So just a real quick uh, 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 intro to the panel. We do want to pause in a moment to give some time for questions before we move on to the workshop. Uh, but, but Tristan made some notes about the panel process. And every year we gather a group of diverse panelists representing lots of different disciplines from, the cross, from across the country. It is an outside panel. St Rasmussen Foundation staff do not review the applica applications to make determinations. We review them for completeness and eligibility before they get to the panel. But once it's out of our hands, all the panel has to review your work is what you've presented. Um, and we uh, gather um, more than a dozen um, artists and they are uh, a broad spectrum of uh, folks who are working across the field uh, and represent um, lots of different groups um, and identities. And uh, some are working artists, some are artists uh, working in the field or teaching artists, uh, some represent other national uh, foundations or organizations across uh, the United States. Uh, so one uh, interesting perspective to have, even if you aren't getting an award, is that your work is being reviewed by uh, a panel of experts every year. And the panel is looking for exactly what Tristan noted the criteria uh, in the application is. They're looking for the artistic quality given experience. If you're an emerging artist, they're looking at work as an emerging artist. Uh, if you have uh, identified as a mid-career or a mature artist, but your work is uh, in its early stages, the panel will look at that. They're looking at the accomplishments you've had thus far, uh, and those are going to be unique to each individual and to each craft. The impact the project will have on your growth. Uh, how is this project meaningful to you as an artist? How will that help you propel? And then, of course, the completeness of your application. And this is important to note because applications that are incomplete do not advance to the panelists. And that is a heartbreaking uh, situation. Uh, we've had this come up often where every element of the application is there, but it's missing a vital part. It's missing a resume or it's missing the artist statement. Those applications can't advance. To combat that, we've put a early review deadline of February 14th, Valentine's Day. Uh, so it's easy to remember. It is a early review deadline. If you get your application in by February 14th, staff of the foundation will look at it review it for eligibility and completeness. And if there are any issues, we will send it back to you to, uh, to complete it. We're not looking at it uh, to critique your narrative or your project, but we will look at it for eligibility and completeness. Okay, and we'll just um, uh, move to the Q&A uh, after we uh, talk a little bit about cultural appropriation. Uh, so uh, we are really mindful of uh, the practice of cultural appropriation or cultural, uh, creative cultural collaboration and exchange. And uh, real quickly, we'll just uh, define cultural appropriation for folks who might not be familiar. And it's the unacknowledged or inappropriate adoption of practices, customs, ideas, images, theories of one people or a society by members of another that are often more do dominant or more privileged. Uh, and it shifts the power dynamic and, and, and quite simply is uh, folks who are not in a culture or in a tradition making work that belongs to another culture or tradition that they are not connected or rooted to. Uh, we have a really great flow chart at the base of the guidelines that we've uh, borrowed from the Alutic Museum that helps you to identify if the work you are doing uh, is uh, within uh, the context of appropriation or creative collaboration. And I will bounce it to Tristan to speak a little bit more about uh, the idea of uh, responsible cultural exchange. There's a lot of nuances around what is cultural exchange or responsive creative collaboration. And it's really the uh, up to the artist to um, 
have that conversation with the community that they are uh, having that, that cultural exchange with. Um, we know, we understand that there are people who have immigrated into um, different regions of Alaska and are within these very culturally rich communities and um, do have that, that cultural exchange. And we see that and we recognize that. And um, that's a conversation that you have with your community, but it's also good to understand um, what that looks like on a larger scale. Um, does this benefit just you? Does this benefit the community? Um, is there a shared benefit? Is uh, there, sh there shared control? Um, and so it, it's really up to the artist to, to have that conversation with, the, with their community that they are from, if that is appropriate, if you are um, not of that, of that community. Uh, and also we wanted to note that we do work with a cultural expert, um, our cultural expert, Sonia, uh, to review each application that is flagged for possible cultural appropriation. And this is really to protect the artists of color that we have um, that do apply and ensuring that there is that, that responsible creative collaboration um, between artists. So wanted to give a shout out to, to our cultural expert for providing that um, for us. Great, thank you so much, Tristan. And just a note on that as well, uh, our cultural strategist and expert is a contract uh, person. This is what they do. Uh, and uh, we are so grateful for their uh, work and partnership. So I'm gonna hold the slide um, on uh, the adaptation and innovation program uh, that Andrea spoke to um, uh, at our intro. But I do wanna honor uh, the time of our co-hosts that we have here and um, to make sure to keep us on track. So while this slide is up, uh, I do wanna open it up to some questions and uh, I'm gonna bounce it to uh, Emily, uh, Emily Kwan and our team uh, in, uh, if Emily can take us through the chat box uh, and maybe share some of the questions that have come up. Uh, and we also encourage you at this time, um, if you have a question for any of the co-hosts uh, that are on the call, this would be a great time to ask them those questions as well. Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I don't sound weird. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to try my best to get to questions. If you if you feel like your question that, um, wasn't answered and we have some extra time, uh, feel free to message it again so it's on top of the chat. So here we go. Um, so one somebody, so some of um, Alex R, they ask, um, I would like to ask how criteria are weighed by the panel. For example, an artist may not have any accomplishments due to not applying for, uh, for programs like or similar to IAA. So how would that affect an individual's application? I'll mute. Thank you, Emily. I'll, I'll take a first stab at that. And that's a really great question. And we see this come up a lot, especially because disciplines are so broad and accomplishments look different to every discipline or every creative practice. And our panelists are really thorough. And so they look at your resume, they look at your artist statement, they look at your work uh, and your narrative, and they're looking to see a common thread through it. Um, some start with your work uh, and a note that it's an application they wanna return to. Some start with your resume, uh, which is the place that puts your accomplishments there. The main thing the panelists are looking for is the project, uh, the work, and the artist. Um, is this a project that is, uh, uh, is going to help that artist advance? Um, and not having pages and pages of accomplishments is not going to be a mark against someone, especially if they are emerging artist um, who just hasn't had um, lots of exhibitions. Uh, so we ask you to think about, uh, in terms of your uh, resume, we ask you to think about different moments, different experiences that you can also include. Were you working under a mentor? Can you include that? Have you taken specific workshops that are relevant to your practice as an artist? Um, uh, so you can think about what you're including in that resume differently. Uh, and just making sure that it has a thread that weaves through your narrative, your artist statement, and your um, your project. Tristan, anything to add? 
Um, the, the, what can be included on the resume doesn't have to be um, any studio kind of showings, putting your work in galleries. I think when people think of I and think of art, they think of visual art. Uh, but as you saw with 11 disciplines, we see, we, we recognize that um, practice, our practice is so, so broad. So it can be community collaborations that you've done, um, maybe like group projects that you've done with other artists or uh, any volunteer work that you have done that's, that is, uh, pertains to your art, art, art practice. So uh, just really thinking about like what, um, yeah, what uh, art teaching too. Art teaching could also be um, uh, included in the resume. So anything that is related to your art practice. So volunteer work, um, any community work that you've done, any classes, um, uh, working under a mentor, even if the, that mentor, you know, is your mother, if you're, if your mother is a master skin sewer, you know, make sure to put that in your resume and say that I learned this practice through, through, a, through a tradition. So um, it can look very, very vast. And I think by kind of collecting um, all that you've done and just like putting it in a timeline and then going in and picking the, the, the pieces that really, um, speaks to you and speaks to your your project, um, that's a really great way to start. Awesome. So it looks like there's a couple of follow up questions to the question. So I'll just kind of list them off really quickly. Um, Lisa is asking, where does art teaching fit in? The Denali Arts Council is asking, should the resume be in traditional bullet um, point format? Or is it a narrative form acceptable? And Emma is asking, would crowdfunding projects count as items on a resume? So they're all kind of related. Um, yeah, uh, we're t we'll talk more about this when we get to the workshop, but we, uh, the foundation does allow for an uploaded resume, you know, basic kind of structured resume that you can absolutely include art teaching. If it's relevant to your practice as an artist, it can go on your resume. If it's uh, part-time pilot, that's not relevant to your art practice unless you're a painter that paints aerial photos from the plane. So it has to be relevant to your art practice, then it can go. We also have an option to write a narrative description of your work or accomplishments um, in the application. So it doesn't need to be a specific uploaded resume. It can be something that's more narratively drafted. Thank you. Okay, next question is from John. Please apologize, apologies if I miss uh, say this. Unru, um, he's asking if an individual artist grant is awarded, how does how the um how do they measure outcomes at the end of the grant period? Since the grant is designed to further their artist career, do you look for an increase in sales, gallery representation, or some other metric? Tristan, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Yeah, the um, this is a kind of wishy-washy answer, but it really depends on on what you goals you set up for yourself as an artist. Um, if you want to increase sales, you know, in, include that in in what you want to accomplish. If you want to just do some exploring as an artist, or if you want to do some research. Um, if you want to research a, a, a practice or go to workshops or buy equipment, um, those are going to be within your within your narrative and it's going to um, that's going to be kind of the proposal is, is this is what I want to accomplish. So it's really up to you and also what you think you can do within a year and also with COVID in mind. Um, so just really thinking about, uh, you know, if you can't travel around the world, um, for what's for a fellowship, you know, what, what, uh, what other things can you do um, in, in replacement for that? So uh, we do ask that if you do have like a plan B to also include that um, in your narrative as well. And that can be just kind of tacked onto the bottom. Uh, so yeah, it's really up to you as an artist, what you want to accomplish and then um, bringing that forward and, and saying, you know, this is really going to help me. It's going to help me connect back to my roots. It's going to help me be able to take photos. It's going to help me do, XYZ. 
Yeah, and I'll just add on to that a little bit. Uh, we do a lot of work orienting the panel to what it's like working in Alaska across the state. Uh, you know, often we see a lot of applications come through for studio costs or studio rent or equipping a studio. And uh, panelists aren't aware of how, uh, how limited access to workspace for artists are. And so we uh, have them, we uh, uh, engage a local artist, we engage some other folks uh, representing different areas across the state to work with the panelists and to uh, introduce them to what the challenges and what the unique challenges are to artists working in Alaska. So really, the project or the accomplishments uh, can vary as long as they're within those eligible uh, categories. Thank you. Next question is from Jen Seaver Rucko. She's asking, can I use work that was completed while I was enrolled as a student, but was done completely separate from any supervision of an instructor? <laughs> I think Tristan and I were testing to see who would take this one first. That's tricky. Uh, the guidelines uh, say that uh, the um, application is not eligible to students who are currently enrolled uh, in a degree seeking program related to fine arts. Um, so it, that, that's one piece if it's, you're in a degree seeking program, but also work cannot, work samples uh, from while that artist was enrolled uh, under the supervision or enrolled in that program are also not eligible. Uh, the panel really wants to see that as an emerging artist, you are, even though you're early in your career and, uh, and beginning that um, path, you do have an established portfolio that was separate from time that you were in, um, enrolled in a university or degree seeking program. Tristan, any thoughts? Uh, that felt like a trick question. <laughs> so indeed, <laughs> you answered it well. Thank you, thank you. Next question from Melanie Lynch. Does the panel provide feedback? If an artist is not selected, is the feedback available? Yeah, so I'll jump on that one. Um, uh, the uh, feedback is uh, an apt out. So when you uh, register, if you have not applied before, uh, and when you uh, register your account and start to fill out your application, you can select receive panelist feedback. Uh, if you select that, you will see feedback. And we do our best also to capture feedback that happens during a conversation. So we really encourage, we spend a lot of time working with the panelists to encourage them to leave feedback. In every communication we have with them, we tell them how important it is to give feedback to artists. But again, we are not part of that application review process or application scoring process. So uh, it's once the applications are in the hands of the panelists, uh, if that panelist chooses to leave feedback, that's up to them. It's not, um, uh, you know, they won't get released if they don't uh, provide feedback. But, um, you know, panelists are really tuned into how important that is. And so we can't say with certainty that every application will receive feedback. And unfortunately, that's the case. But we do encourage panelists to leave feedback that is constructive, um, that does give some framework and context into either why the application was selected or not selected. And I think um, I think we'll pause there. I know there are a lot of questions. Uh, we will have an opportunity at the end, we've uh, put in about a half hour at the end of the workshop for questions. Um, so I do wanna be uh, a mindful of our schedule. Uh, so we're gonna pause there and take a just short of a 10 minute break. Um, and uh, we will see you all back uh, at 6.30. So we will keep all of this open. Uh, but we encourage you to get up and walk around, uh, take a stretch, get a drink of water, and we will see you back at 630. All right, uh, I wanted to bring us back together. 
uh, from our stretch break uh, and remind folks uh, we have another about an hour and a half and uh, please um, remember to get up and stretch and uh, move around as you need to. Um, some folks may have just joined us and I want to say welcome uh, and introduce myself again briefly. My name is Enzina Murari. I'm a practicing artist and program officer with the Rasmussen Foundation. I'm joined here with some uh, Rasmussen Foundation colleagues and my partner in crime tonight co-hosting this event is Tristan Aganarak Morgan. Uh, we are also joined by some fantastic co-hosts, uh, Andrea Noble, uh, Andrea Pallant with the Alaska State Council on the Arts, Adele Pearson with Bunnell Street Arts Center, Jess Pena with the Fairbanks Arts Association, Reggie Schapp with Juno Arts and Humanities Council, Kathleen Light and Katie Posey with Ketchikan Area Arts, uh, Marlies Lee with Kodiak Histor Historical Society and the History Museum, Carrie Hahn with Nome Arts Council, Sam Dingus with Palmer Museum of History and Art, uh, Hollis Mickey uh, with the Anchorage Museum. So we are so grateful for their support and partnership. We will have an opportunity at the end of this workshop for a extended Q&A. We only had about 15 minutes in part one, but we have 30 dedicated minutes in part two. Uh, if our co-hosts are still with us, we also encourage you to ask questions um, to uh, folks, uh, uh, those folks, if you have them. And uh, I will again remind folks to please keep your mics muted. Uh, you are welcome to have your camera on or off to your comfort level. Uh, and we ask for some patience and grace as we move through this. Uh, this is a experiment for us. It's the first virtual workshop we've done um, in the program to this capacity. And we are going to be experimenting with breakout rooms shortly. So uh, we, we uh, did some rehearsals and they went smooth, but we all know how that goes. So we ask in advance for your patience as we um, work through that a little bit. So part one is the application step by step. Uh, and uh, 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 Tristan will uh, start us off. So the online application can be found on our website, rasmussen.org. The ribbon right up top says grants, initiatives, about an arts. If you already have applied for an individual artist award, you can just go straight to grants login, but you can get to the individual artist award landing page by either going to grants, um, initiatives, or arts. So any one of those will take you straight to the individual artist award. And then we have that really nice uh, photo right there, the individual artist award that can just be clicked right there. We have that in the ribbon that kind of uh, rotates. If you go onto the website, you'll be able to access that from a few different places. So this is the landing page. This is, um, it goes to grants, individual artist awards, and then project awards and fellowship. And uh, as you can see on the right side, it has apply for IAA, and then the guidelines right under that, which you can download and either look on your computer, on your device, or print them out. We suggest um, if you are a tactile person, printing them out is, is really helpful. Both in Zena and I are very tactile people. And uh, the toolkit right underneath those guidelines, that is uh, a really great source, um, a resource for artists because we have templates in there for resumes and we have uh, a little snippet on how to take good photographs with an iPhone if you don't have access to a photographer. So there are um, resources within that toolkit that will be able to help. So we ask that before you even go into applying for the application on the website, definitely download the guidelines and have that side by side when you're applying for the for the grant um, or the fellowship on when you have that up. So either have it printed out or have it next to your screen. And we also provide a paper application. So um, definitely keep that in mind if, if you or if you need a paper application or know someone who needs a paper application, reach out to that to us and we'll be able to provide support for that. 
And so this is the login page. And this is where um, once you go and create, a, create an account, if you don't already have one, it's going to ask you to best describe the organization. And um, no one here is applying as a nonprofit organization. So completely skip those top three and you're going to apply under the individual artist registration or the art group and collective. So this is where you really have to think about uh, whether or not you're applying as an individual or if you're gonna be applying as an art group or collective because when you start your, your sign up, you do have to make that distinction. And now uh, this is the landing page for starting your application. Um, and you'll just go up to that top button that says start application. Again, that draft review deadline is February 14th. So if you do submit your online application, we'll review it for completeness. And then the paper application is due on February 15th. So it is a little bit earlier of a date than the online application. And that's really so that way we can ensure that if there are any missing pieces that we can reach out to you and also input all the information online so that way that it can be um, looked at uh, alongside all of the online applications. So that deadline is a little bit sooner than the online application. So please keep that in mind when you're applying. And so this is the uh, instructions tab. So this is kind of the, the whole ribbon. So this is a, all that all of that you're going to be applying in. So these are kind of the table of contents that you have for, for the overview, the deadline, um, the whole application, how to apply, all of those are within the instructions. And then you can go into the cover sheet, go into the artist statement that you have to include, um, upload your work samples. So it's a really nice kind of ribbon on top for that. And this is what it looks like from the web view. So just a, a note there that, um, that uh, this is from the, the web view and not from a mobile device. If you are applying through a mobile device, um, if, if you're having issues with that, definitely reach out to, to us about that as well. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll help you through that process. Cover sheet, just drop down menus. Um, not sure what else to <laughs> include about this slide. <laughs> all of your information. And then also going over the kind of the career, so the, the, the award category, the so project award or fellowship, um, the career stage, those three career stages, and then the artistic discipline that you're applying under. So those are all important to know when, um, when you're going into the, uh, into the application process. And I'll pass this off to Vina. Yeah, thanks so much, Tristan, for guiding us through that first part of the application. So we just wanted to show you, since this is a new uh, feature since last year, uh, what the application will look like if you've selected that you are part of a group or a collaborative. Uh, we ask for the name of the group. Uh, again, if it is a, a time-based collective, uh, what is the name of that project or what is the name of the group? Um, if it is a long standing group uh, or collective, of course, that would go there. And then we've also identified a few key roles within that group. Uh, we call them the project director or project leads. These are the individuals that take ownership of the project and the application. It's important to note that that project director is also the one that will receive the award and is then responsible for dispersing it amongst the group. Uh, and also important is that the uh, collaborators, uh, and for this sake, the collaborators of the project application are the director and the leads. If awarded, similar to an individual artist, if awarded, those collaborators, those that take ownership or leadership of the project and application will have to wait three years before applying again. But we also know that groups and collaboratives look vastly different. Uh, there might be a 60 person choir with members at large that come and go and may not be present for the duration of the project, don't really have much of a leadership role at all, or are other members of, uh, they might be a costume designer or a contract web designer, et cetera. So we ask that you include the, the big number of the full um, scope of the collective but we don't ask for their names uh, and they are not considered 
uh, a collaborator, collaborator or have ownership in that application. And then I'll just whiz us through the timeline and budget as well. Uh, so every application, whether you're a project award applicant or a fellowship, has to include a proposed timeline of how you will achieve what you're proposing within a year. And again, we are being mindful and respectful and flexible of the um, uh, lack of predictability with COVID, uh, but we do encourage you to think about projects that can be achieved within these unpredictable times. Uh, and to have a plan B and include that plan B if something that might require gathering is going to be restricted. Uh, we also know timelines are estimates. So uh, should that change, uh, if you are awarded, we just ask that you communicate with us and let us know that the timeline has changed. And then if you are applying as a project, again, you do have to include a budget. Uh, well, uh, if you have specific questions about eligible fees for a budget, again, we encourage you to put them in the chat, but expenses can be broad. Uh, Childcare can be an eligible expense in the project budget. Equipment costs could be an eligible expense. Travel costs to do research of uh, your, uh, 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 the history of an art form that you're incorporating into your practice. So the eligible expenses can vary. Uh, and we just ask that if you're not sure if it is something that would work to let us know. If you are applying for a fellowship, you will not see this area. So you do not have to submit a budget uh, for a fellowship uh, award. And then work samples. And we do want to um, point out a couple of things because this has uh, occurred every year. Uh, you have to fill out each of these um, box areas. So the title, the medium, the year, and the description. You will be able to advance your application, but you will not be able to submit your application unless each field is, uh, is uh, filled in. Uh, and this has happened in the past where, uh, you know, Tristan had mentioned the, uh, uh, the deadline of March 1st at 11.59 p.m., but we encourage you to apply sooner. Um, even the best platforms have, can have issues uh, with mass traffic um, uh, at the same time. Uh, we've also had several applicants who were on their application and their Wi-Fi crashed at 11.59 and came back on at 12.03 and then their application was late and not eligible. So we encourage you to get it in early. Um, and uh, you know what, ha what we saw happen last year was an applicant who had their entire application filled, did not fill the description, uh, was able to advance, but wasn't able to finally submit their application. The, the program just wouldn't let them. So keep that in mind, the description has to be there. And also the description is really, really useful. Again, uh, Tristan and I are there to facilitate the panel process. The only information the panel has about your work is the information that you've provided. So if they have a question about the work, uh, we're not gonna be able to answer that. So that's where the description of the work comes into play. Uh, you know, This came up last year during the panel process. Uh, there was a, a visual uh, art sample and the panel wasn't clear if the artist did the carving or if it was a found object. And so being really clear about the work um, is, is really helpful and just gives the panel a better understanding of who you are as an artist. And then submitting. Uh, and I'll just echo uh, Tristan's notes about the uh, draft deadline. Again, that's Valentine's Day, February 14th. The paper application is February 15th and March 1st by 11.59 p.m. to the dot. It's in the system. We don't have responsibility. Um, if it comes in at midnight, it's too late. Um, and uh, uh, we also want to uh, call attention to the view PDF. You can view the PDF, you can save the draft, you can save the PDF on your computer, but until you hit submit app, uh, application, it's not submitted into the system. So save, save, save. Uh, we also encourage you to write all of the narrative in a separate Word document that you can cut and paste so that if something crashes, you still have it and it is not lost within the system. Okay. So that takes us uh, right into part two, which is the narrative plan. And we will 
um, experiment with a breakout session uh, in just um, a couple moments. And so the narrative portion of the application uh, includes the uh, resume and artist statement. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. They can be uploaded as attachments or written right into the application. And then four narrative questions uh, that we will go over. So one of those questions is to provide, please provide a clear and concise overview of the proposal. That is one in the application. So start, you all can start thinking about that now. What will you do if you receive a grant award? What is your project or fellowship focus? How will your proposal advance, enrich your artistic career and development? So that kind of ties back into that criteria. And why is this work important? And this is an opportunity for you to speak about why your work matters to you, why it's important, uh, why you're putting it out in the world, and why the panelists should be, uh, 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 what you want the panelists to learn about you and to learn about your work. Uh, and then of course, a timeline and a project budget for project awards. Um, and I'll just remind folks, I see a couple of hands up and we do ask uh, that you hold questions to the end uh, and we will carve out about 30 minutes, uh, but please do write your questions um, in the chat box. So I'll ask uh, Tristan to chime in here, but uh, you know, we uh, often reflect on the five C's of grant writing or the five C's of uh, a successful application, which is that your application is clear, concise, consistent, compelling, and complete, right? It's clear, it's not confusing. If a, a uninformed reader uh, that is uh, invested in the arts or an uninformed reader that uh, isn't really involved in the arts at all, they read your project, they will have a clear idea of what you're trying to do, right? There isn't a lot of confusing, confusing language, there isn't vagueness, it, it's very clear and describes what your intention is. It is concise. Uh, we do have word limits um, uh, woven into the program, but it's concise, it's short, it, it's uh, impactful. There's consistency, and this is true. I was speaking about you know, all elements of the application weaving together, right? So the resume matches the artist statement. All of those make sense and support the narrative proposal and the work samples reflect that. Um, if there's someone who uh, their project is to travel with Bruce Springsteen uh, on tour, but all of their work samples are sculptural, that's inconsistency uh, in the application. And it's compelling, right? So this speaks again to why is this work important? And that's really an opportunity for you to pull the panelists in and to learn about who you are as an artist. Tristan, any thoughts? Not yet. We are going to talk a little bit more in detail about the artist statement, and I think I'll, I'll reserve my comments for then. Great, thank you. Okay, so now comes the big experiment. Uh, and again, we ask uh, for your patience as we uh, 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 hope that this smoothly operates. So we're gonna take about 15 minutes to do some workshopping. In a moment, I will put you into rooms. Uh, the system will randomly generate where you go. We ask that you have your camera on uh, so it can uh, replicate being in a working environment with uh, another person. And we're gonna have you workshop the first question on the application, which is please provide a clear and concise overview of the proposal. So after we put you in the rooms, You'll have five minutes on your own to brainstorm, right? Without thinking about structure, without thinking about word count, think about that question. What is the overview of your project? What do you want to do? Think about what you want to do, and in five minutes, just write it all down. And then we're going to take 10 minutes, and I will be keeping time and broadcasting to your rooms um, uh, the cues, the timing cues. In the next 10 minutes, I want you all to take turns reading out loud your project concept, asking your break room partners what they heard you say, and then you doing the same for them. I'm gonna turn it over to Tristan to talk us through some important elements to drafting an artist statement. So the artist statement, um, and the reason why I wanted to talk to you guys about this was 
uh, because I, I recently created an artist statement for a show this last month because I am a practicing artist. I forgot to tell you guys at the beginning, um, I am a practicing contemporary artist. Uh, so this is something that um, we come into contact with a lot as, as artists when we do share our work with the community at large. And um, where do we start? You wanna brainstorm why you do this, who you are, what did you, what did you do in the process and, and how you did it? Um, put out an outline, uh, create an outline for, for what your artist statement is. Maybe put some buzzwords in there that you know that, apologies, um, that you know that, that are going to be really important words um, within your artist statement. Um, if, if your project is about culture, make sure to include the significance of, of the cultural piece if it's something that will help you um, uh, I'm, I'm trying a blank on here, but but yeah, if you do have have um, buzzwords, definitely include them. Uh, create a, a draft and maybe create like a, a brain kind of um, a cloud where you where you kind of put put off of really kind of big ideas uh, that you want to get out, and then kind of go into the nitty gritty of of exactly what you're saying and why you're saying it. And you want to be really concise. Um, you want to make sure that you that you that you share a statement that not going to be wordy and breathy and, and um, have the person reading it kind of fall off halfway through. Um, so they kind of want to be kind of a, a punch. You kind of want to punch with your artist statement and you want to be able to um, share exactly what you're, you're saying uh, within you know, a few sentences to a paragraph to two, a few paragraphs. Um, and edit out anything that doesn't really make sense or any, edit anything out that's too vague because you don't want anything that's too vague and maybe even uh, create several drafts of the same artist statement and then proofread it, read it out loud, read it out loud to yourself, read it out loud to your friend, read it out loud to another artist, you know, read it out loud to someone who has no idea what you're doing. Um, read it to your grandma, you know, just try and, and get as many opinions as you can um, if you do doubt kind of that aspect because uh, they're going to come at you with questions of, well, I didn't really understand that. Um, could you expand on that? And you know that your language is not as concise as it could be. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just add on that if you don't mind, Tristan. Um, uh, you know, really, when we think about the artist statements, I'm glad Tristan reminded us that they are a practicing artist. Um, I am also a practicing artist and we know it's really hard to write about ourselves uh, and our own work. So we, we like to encourage folks to think about the artist statement as the what, the why, and the how. What are you doing? Uh, what are you trying to do with your work? Why, why is it important? Why do you put it out there? Why should someone reviewing your work invest in it? And then how, how are you doing it? Is it interpreted through photography? Is it through the written word? The what, why, and how? And an exercise that um, I like to think about, uh, uh, I encourage folks to do is just kind of a, a free write where you just think about the what, why, and how and put everything on the page and then go back and circle words or phrases that stand out and then build your statement from there. And then everything Tristan was saying about proofreading, reading to others, uh, making sure that what you're trying to say is, is really understood. So again, stay away from these big general statements. So my work is about my experience. Well, all of our work is about our experiences. Um, you know, I've, I've been drawing since I was three years old. That doesn't really give an idea as to what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, if you're a bit more specific and, you know, said that this is a, this is a tradition that's passed down and I've been doing this my entire life, you know, that's a little bit more broad, a little bit more concise than, I've been drawing since I was three years old um, or that, you know, I pour my soul into each piece. We, we are, the panel is, is made up of, of artists, made up with people who are familiar with the arts. They know exactly why artists do the things that they do. Um, they understand that, that it's, you know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a very personal practice and it can also be a very um, business oriented practice. Um, so uh, just kind of keep that in mind to stay away from, from those very vague statements because there's, you have a, a limit. So you wanna pack as much information 
about yourself and about your art as you can within that limit. And if you have these vague statements, they're just taking up space for more information that you can provide to the panelists to let them know that this is something um, that I'm, I'm very interested in and that I wanna prepare most, propel myself for it as an artist. And also uh, another kind of um, practice that you could do is record yourself. Just talk about your art like you would talk about your art um, to one of your family members, friends, or community members. Just record yourself and pick up on, on words and phrases, kind of like the circular, circling, circling method, um, except just listen to that. Or have someone else share what they think your art is about. Um, and that gives you kind of a perspective of what you're trying to communicate with the panelists and what ultimately what you're trying to communicate as an artist to the viewer. That's really the most important part. Yeah, thanks so much, Tristan. Uh, we're gonna rush through, we're so sorry, the next few slides because we do wanna give you all an opportunity to ask questions and have them answered. Um, so I'm just gonna breeze through these next a uh, couple, so bear with me. Uh, so the artist resume, um, uh, you'll have heard of an artist resume or a CV. A CV is a curriculum vitae. It covers uh, the full history of your practice uh, um, and is very comprehensive. And a resume is your selected feature. Uh, it can be brief, it can be longer. And really this is where you list out your work, your progress, your training, uh, Tristan and I mentioned mentorships, uh, someone you studied under, or uh, things you've been a part of, exhibitions, workshops, et cetera. Um, and uh, the basic structure of a, a resume, if it is not written in the narrative, is to include your contact, your education. If you have, uh, if you're a visual artist and have had exhibitions, if you're literary, you've had publications, you're a performance artist, list those productions, et cetera. Um, and then the rest are really relevant to you. Uh, residencies may not apply. Awards, grants, fellowships may not apply. So really those other headings are relevant to your practice. And then of course, include any press, any notable collections, any volunteer or related experience. Uh, and Tristan did a, a fantastic job last year of providing three different resume templates that are on the artist toolkit button on our website. So those templates exist. You can download those and just pop your relevant experience in or change them around to meet your needs. And, it, and we know this is very Western and not applicable to every craft or art making or art practice. So if your history of your art making is more narrative and more rooted in story and experience, you have an opportunity to write that narrative into the application. Okay, um, so just some comments from panelists. Um, and and this, is the, this is taken out of feedback directly to artists. Uh, what does it mean to create a new body of work? That speaks to that compelling nature and the panelists really wanting to understand the artist. What specifically are you looking to create? There was lack of clarity in that application. So really kind of toning back into those five C's of clear, concise, consistent, and compelling, and also complete. Um, and really making sure that there is that consistency um, to dream big, to, to write in specifics, to really be able uh, to present your work uh, to an audience that is not familiar with you or your work. Um, the application is really the only thing the panelists have to go on. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we encourage you to think about those uh, different aspects of presenting your best self. Okay, we have a few minutes to go through some work samples uh, and then we'll turn it over to uh, uh, questions. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to Tristan to take us through the next three slides that provide some context on work samples. The really big things to focus on for anyone who's submitting video and audio, audio work is focus and clarity, the white balance, so the, the, um, the lighting for any video or, or um, photos, or, but especially videos sound quality, and then queuing and editing. Queuing and editing, I really want to uh, note that if you submit a uh, work sample that is 
10 minutes long, nine minutes long. And the first half isn't necessary to the work sample. Um, make sure that you have those queuing kind of aspects where you tell the, the panelists that you want them to start, you know, a minute in or two minutes in, or just completely edit that video down um, to, to that work sample to what you want. So keep that in mind for any video or audio samples that you submit. Any written works, uh, make sure it's neatly typed and clearly reproduced. Proofread it, obviously. Um, one of the biggest things that, that we, or not one of the biggest things, but one of the things that we see is um, uh, track changes. So if you submit a Word document, make sure to take off of those track changes so that way the uh, panel, the panelist doesn't see those, um, those edits in your, in your final work. So submit it like how you, you would submit a, um, uh, a professional body of work without that track changes. And uh, make sure to choose carefully, make sure that, that you have uh, kind of the, the, the meat of what you're wanting to submit as your sample. So similar to kind of the Q&A editing for video and audio, just make sure you, you choose your excerpts carefully and um, that you don't, that the reader doesn't have to have Q in any context is for, for what you're trying to say. So make sure it kind of stands alone by itself while also being a part of work. And then photo uh, general tips. We do have, again, that, um, that toolkit and that has a uh, kind of comprehensive um, uh, resource for how to take photographs with an iPhone because we understand a lot of people aren't going to have access to professional photographers, especially during COVID. So make sure that the work is presented in a white or black or gray, just a neutral background. Um, natural light works really well for any visual pieces, um, but make sure that that lighting looks great in, in any of the photos as well, and is, is able, you're able to really show the breadth of the work. And um, crop down the images, make sure no edges are, are, are um, around your, your photographs. So make sure it just looks nice and clean and. And uh, even if you don't have a professional uh, photographer on hand or aren't a, a, a professional photographer, you can definitely still set things up. And I can definitely attest uh, going to UAA, how many funky setups I have had to create while holding like two lamps uh, against my work. So it can be done and it can be done on a budget. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out what works best for your work and how to showcase it in the best light that you could possibly take it in. Whew, I tried going through that as fast as possible. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tristan. Um, we did have a really fun uh, exercise uh, for you all, but we um, are out of time. So we do want to uh, give uh, the next, dedicate the next 20 minutes um, to a, a Q&A. Um, I will stop my screen share for the moment. I will put up some resources uh, towards the end of our Q&A. Um, but I'm going to pass it back to Emily uh, to take us through. Again, we know that we will not get to all of your questions. So we encourage you, if we have not answered your question, to please reach out to us at arts at rasmussen.org and we will make sure uh, to respond. Emily. Hello, it's me, Emily. You, some of y'all probably see me pop into your break room. Um, and just to reiterate, we will be posting a recording of this workshop as well as the slides uh, if anyone had any questions about that. So I will be, so I will start. So a question from Katie Lawrence. Should the artist statement express personal artistic aesthetic or be specific to the project we're applying for? Great question. Your artist statement should be about your work as an artist, not about the project. Uh, you can relate to the project, but that artist statement is an opportunity for the panel to get a full picture of who you are as an artist and not just about the project that you're proposing. That content is really going to be included in the narrative. Thank you, Zena. Next question is from Cindy. Uh, for emerging artists, can a portfolio highlight more than one medium that show growth in art practice and vision? 
understanding that only one application can be submitted. I'll, I'll jump in and take a stab at this and then if Tristan has any. Um, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding the correct the, um, question correctly. Um, so there's a couple of different media that the artist works in. They're wondering if they can upload those images in their application. Um, I would say you want to be real mindful about the samples that you're providing and your statement because those samples evidence your ability to complete that project to the panel. And if there's confusion around that, um, if you know, you're proposing a painting project, but nine out of 10 samples are um, sculpture, that might uh, give the panel some pause that you're able to achieve the project that you're proposing. Uh, if your project is, is multimedia uh, and your samples are multimedia, there's that consistency there. So, I would be mindful of that um, in terms of uh, the ability to execute the project. And again, if you have questions to let us know and we can help with that. Anything to add, Tristan? I think it did. What you put on your resume has to, it, it can show kind of your growth as an artist, um, but it can take away a little bit from exactly why you're doing the project. If, if you have all these kind of other factors there or other sectors that you're exploring. Um, but if that's, if that's important to your project, um, say you, you want to do more kind of, or expand on the exploration that you've already done um, and just kind of uh, talking about that within your, um, within the project statement and explain that, you know, I've, I have explored a lot of different art forms, but I really want to explore this art form and why and how I'm going to do it, um, there you can you can kind of uh, catapult off of that that resume being um, a little bit more kind of all over the place. So there there is definitely that balance, and um, uh, just take a really good look at it all together, and and um, or have someone else take a look at it all together. Your the full PDF, and say, does this all kind of match? Does what I'm saying match with my work samples? Does it so? just go through that process. Thank you. Um, next question is from Brandy Harding. What if my resume has large gaps due to things like having young children and not having the ability to practice art to the extent that you want to? I do ceramics, but I have had to find other forms of expression these past seven years since the art form doesn't really lend itself to walking away when a child needs you. Great question. Um, I don't think there's any issue with that. Um, you know, we do recommend uh, that work samples be within five years. And if you are providing work samples that are older than that, just to include that in your description, uh, the panelists really want to see artists that are currently producing. But we have had award recipients who have had breaks uh, in their art making because of life, because of family um, responsibilities or children or, or, or other things that came up and it didn't prevent them from receiving the award. So just make sure that that story and that, uh, that those gaps are captured and that you include what, uh, what caused that gap um, and how uh, picking that back up now will move you forward again and kind of uh, enrich your artistic development. And to me, that's what that speaks to is your artistic development. Um, and so I would really connect those things together. And again, with work samples that are older than five years, um, there must be an ind uh, indicated reason why those are included um, because panelists do wanna see that you are currently producing. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Sharon Thoreau. If we know that our idea is collaborative and we desire to bring in others, perhaps from individuals outside, is this allowed? This is an Alaska-based grant. So unfortunately, no. Uh, all applicants, all of the artists in the project uh, that are part of the project uh, must be Alaska residents. Uh, so uh, two years having been an Alaska resident, 
um, and, and committed to staying in Alaska for one year after the award, similar to the PFB. Now, there are some intricacies there, uh, depending on, on how you'll be involving people from out of Alaska. Uh, so uh, there might be some nuance to that. And we ask that you reach out to us so we can talk with you about that idea to make sure that that would be an eligible project, depending on how you wanted to integrate someone who wasn't um, Alaskan uh, and what that project would look like. But it is limited to current Alaska residents. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I see a lot of uh, pretty specific questions, um, such as what would stained glass art be, um, what discipline would that fall under? And if my art jewelry, if my jewelry is inspired by a poem, can I include the poem when I upload the image and put the poem in the description? Um, and also, everyone remember, if we don't get to your question, you can always email arts at rasmussen.org. Take it away. Yeah, so the uh, stained glass is interesting because it kind of opens up that conversation of some works being able to float uh, around the different disciplines. And um, I will uh, uh, check in with Tristan and Karen to see if they um, have any other ideas. But I feel like uh, that is... Uh, uh, can be dependent on the artist and, and how they identify their practice, but I could absolutely see stained glass being applied under visual arts or under crafts, uh, depending on how that artist perceives their work. Um, Tristan, Karen, any other thoughts outside of that? That sounds good to me. Um, the other question, Emily, uh, was if uh, part your jewelry maker inspired by a poem. Could you use that poem in the description? Yes. Keep in mind word counts. Um, the project, every uh, field has a limited word count. So as long as that poem fits within that word count uh, in the description, you can absolutely include that as the inspiration. And then Emily, there was one more and I missed it. So let's see. Oh, I think those are the two okay. that I saw. Um, but we're gonna choo-choo the question train along. So I see from Emma, is there any place we can view submitted grants from previous IAA years as an example? Ah, uh, great question and one that we get a lot. Uh, the applications are confidential, so we don't release who's applied. Uh, you know, this is a, a, again, I'll reiterate, this is a highly competitive uh, uh, award process. Um, and uh, we don't release uh, that information and we want to protect all of the artists and their work and their experiences. Um, uh, you know, Tristan was speaking to the artist statement and the vulnerability of, of exposing oneself. So we don't uh, provide access to applica applications, but what we do encourage artists to do is to look at the website. Um, all previous award recipients are listed. Uh, the, the recipients for the last three years, you can see their, their photos and their projects on our website, but you can also see all of the award recipients uh, back to 2004. So we encourage you to look at those artists to see if there's someone who you're familiar with, uh, whose work is similar to you, um, and to reach out to them uh, to see if they'd be willing to share their application with you or to give you some feedback or tips. Awesome, next question uh, from the Denali Arts Council. Are you looking for the allowed 500 words or is brevity preferred? Oh, this is such a horrible answer. It depends, <laughs> right? Um, so keep in mind that uh, depending on your discipline, a panelist is going to be reviewing anywhere from 30 applications to potentially 80 applications, uh, depending, uh, maybe um, somewhere in between uh, that range. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're uh, communicating your project, yourself as an artist, as concise as you can. If it takes up to 500 words, if that's the story, then it takes up to 500 words. Um, uh, if it's, it can be communicated in fewer words, then that would be appropriate too. Um, don't cut yourself short because you're worried about length. 
but also don't go the whole um, uh, the whole word count because you're worried about brevity. So uh, do what's appropriate to communicate yourself as an artist. Uh, Tristan, Karen, any thoughts about that? Nope, other than it depends. I still think uh, the best advice I ever got was you are trying to make your intentions go in a straight line to the panelists. So be very clear. If it takes you 500 words, that's okay. If it takes you 100 and it's very clear, um, it's your one opportunity to talk to them. Just be very succinct and clear and full of enthusiasm. <laughs> you have to support your own work. You have to you have to totally believe in your own work. You're your best advocate. Awesome. So I see a number of questions about will this session be recorded? Can we view it later? And yes, we will post this recording on our website and on our YouTube. Yes, we have a YouTube. You can subscribe at Rasmussen Foundation. Um, so yeah, so keep a lookout. Uh, we will put that there for, for viewing later. I see another question about budget. So does your budget, so from Alex R, does your budget have to account to 7,500 exactly? Yes, it does. It's a flat rate, it's a flat grant. So uh, some folks think, uh, have thought in the past, oh, I'll apply for 4,000, it, it might, be more likely to accept it, but it is a $7,500 flat project. Um, and, uh, you know, some folks might say, well, my project doesn't meet $4,500 or $7,500. And we ask you to reach out to us because there are so many hidden costs uh, in art making uh, that some folks don't realize they can include in their budget, like uh, rent or internet costs, Wi Fi, um, phone uh, charges. So, um, uh, reach out to us if you're having trouble with your budget and making that meet 7,500. And also your project can exceed $7,500. Uh, we just encourage you that if it does exceed that you indicate how you will make up the difference, whether it's self or other grants or other funding. Um, so 7,500 is the, the flat uh, award amount. Awesome. So I do have two follow-up questions. One, uh, the first one is, do you include in your budget your fee as an artist in producing work? And the second one is, is food expenses included in travel in the budget? Yes, you absolutely. And, you know, we recognize that, um, uh, that paying yourself as an artist is uh, important and valuable, and we encourage that. And food, travel, those are absolutely approved costs. The one thing we we uh, caution, uh, sometimes uh, folks have written an entire budget for time. Um, and though that's uh, valid and artists need time, it doesn't really give the panel an idea of what you're going to do within that time uh, and, how, and, and where the costs are going to go. So be more specific, uh, but you can absolutely in include costs like that. Karen, any other thoughts? Yeah, I would say that um, after sitting through a, a few panels, it's it's not a good idea to make your entire budget your artist fee. Um, be intentional about what you're doing. And also, um, this money is to be used in, for the future. So you if you if you are having trouble figuring out how to make that budget make sense, give me a call or uh, email. Email us at arts at rasmussen.org. Um, it's the hardest thing to do, but often artists forget that there are things that you can expend money on. So if you're stuck there, let us know. And I'll just add, uh, uh, Nick, our fantastic IT consultant, uh, just reminded me that in the application, in the narrative, uh, the system doesn't allow you to uh, exceed 7,500. Uh, it just isn't built for that. But please include that in your narrative uh, in the written um, portion if your project does go above 7,500. 
There's just one uh, comment in the chat, um, and this is really important to think about. Can we pay for other professionals for services like framing, curating websites, or taking photos of work and process? Yes, yes. Support other creatives. And yes, you have to pay taxes on this award. That's another question. Oh, and one more budget question. Uh, can my expenses for work I have already, can I include expensive for the work I've already created in my budget? And I see no. Yeah, it's for new new projects. Ooh. And um, oh, from Katie Lawrence, it's not a budget question. It, it, um, it's uh, if we are submitting work samples for script writing, can we submit recordings of performed written works as right. example? And Zena, oh. <laughs> and Zena, you're muted. <laughs> oh, I, I said, Karen, I wasn't sure if you were going to answer that. <laughs> um, I believe, Nick, please correct me if I'm wrong. I believe we do allow for uh, an audio sample uh, in uh, the category of script works, uh, but um, I'm going to uh, uh, task Nick to. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. We have so many combinations available. I don't recall offhand, but I've got the um, guidelines up on my other screen. So I'll look for that and I'll put it in the chat in just a moment. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, yeah, we do provide uh, certain disciplines. You can pick a combined work sample uh, where you can include video or audio as well as still images. And uh, we're gonna, Nick's gonna let us know about uh, script works if that, uh, if you can do that as combined work sample. Cool. Um, let's see, a budget, a budget question from Sharon. What if you're awarded funding and the line item budget costs change? Is that allowed? And how are line items moved within the budget categories identified? Oh, so. The first part of that is we understand that there's going to be flux and changes and that these budgets are estimates. So if there is a significant change, we just ask that you reach out to us um, uh, at that point after the award um, has been received. If there are any changes, it will be me uh, that you're working with. Uh, and again, we want to be flexible with you, uh, especially during these times. So if something happens with the budget and cost change or you know, photography ends up being a thousand dollars over the 500 you uh, anticipated, just let us know. Um, uh, you know, we understand that there's a change there. And then the other part of the question, uh, and uh, uh, we realize it's eight o'clock, so we want to be mindful. Uh, we'll take uh, just one more question, I think, Emily, after this one. Um, but I want to make sure I get the second part of that about the line item, and it, it wasn't clear to me. Can you repeat that part? Yes. So it says, how are line items moved within the budget categories identified? I'm assuming if it's the specific items they want to move around. Yeah, they're fields that you populate uh, with numbers and text. So you can move those around uh, really easily, uh, depending on on that structure when you're building uh, the application. Um, so Emily, let's just take one more question and then we'll put some resources on the page. Thank you, Zena. And, if, and then I'm sure everyone heard this 500 million times, but always feel free to email arts at rasmussen.org if you have any questions that were not answered at this session. And we will be posting this recording on our website and YouTube. So the last question, is from Megan. If chosen, in what ways do the artists check back in once the year is complete? Ah, great question. So uh, we uh, have such a, a privilege of making phone calls uh, to let folks they know they've been awarded, uh, which means we also have the horrible job of notifying folks uh, who don't receive the award. But um, the application period end March, ends March 1st. That starts a super busy time for us to review all of those applications for eligibility and completeness. 
once they're reviewed, uh, we pass them on to the panel that review, then takes the entire month of April to individually review all of those applications. And then we come together in May uh, as a, a group, we gather the panelists virtually and May is when uh, the panelists uh, make uh, those really, really hard decisions to select uh, the 35 uh, project award and fellowship recipients. Um, and uh, we notify uh, artists and uh, award recipients. Um, uh, you know, we're a little bit flexible this year because of COVID and having to restructure this process to be completely virtual, but we're anticipating um, early June notification. Uh, we don't have a date set yet, um, but uh, that is when we will notify and, and uh, notify artists who've received the award. Um, and then <laughs> we have a partnership, Hollis, uh, Mickey with the Anchorage Museum uh, uh, was on earlier uh, and spearheads the education department at the museum. And we've worked with the Anchorage Museum for the last three years to provide uh, professional development uh, to artist award recipients. Uh, typically that is, um, that occurs uh, in person. Uh, we do a one and a half full day intensive workshop. Um, we're not gonna be able to do that this year, but we are gonna offer virtual programming uh, for professional development to artist award recipients and likely have some kind of virtual celebration. So our engagement with the artists does not end. Um, at the award, we are really invested in the success of artists in Alaska and of the award recipients. So uh, we'll continue to engage uh, with those folks uh, beyond, um, beyond the award. And we are always interested in what you're doing and encourage you to reach out and let us know um, if you have um, uh, new things coming up um, in your world. Okay. So I've shared my screen one last time uh, just to put some resources for you um, uh, on the page. Again, we've uh, talked about the artist toolkit uh, that we have on our website, some really, really great how-to resources uh, and some of our local resources and also national resources. Uh, we have been recording this uh, presentation, so it will be available. Uh, we will also be having the slideshow. So anything we didn't go over today will be available for you to, to go through at your own pace uh, and uh, level of um, uh, thoroughness. Uh, and uh, again, we encourage you to reach out to arts at rasmussen.org to, uh, with any questions that we were not able to get to this evening. Um, and uh, you know, I'll uh, I'll close with uh, an encouragement. Uh, several artists who have received awards have applied several years. Uh, Karen, who was uh, with us and just speaking moments ago, talks about how uh, in the past she received an award but had applied six times before she did, um, and she just continued at it. And there's a new panel each year. Um, and eventually got it. And, and conversely, we know artists who apply and get it their first time and every situation is unique. Uh, every panel is different. Um, and so we really encourage you to apply, to let go of uh, shaping your application to any particular panelist and really using it as an opportunity to present your work and deep dive into your work. Um, and uh, as much uh, as much as uh, the disappointment weighs, um, to see this process as an opportunity to learn more uh, about who you are as an artist. Um, uh, Tristan, I will pass it to you uh, for uh, any closing thoughts uh, and to take us out. And again, uh, I just wanna thank all of the co-hosts, all of the Rasmussen staff uh, and support on the call. Um, uh, Tristan, take it away. Hi, Netsbook. Thank you so much for every, to everyone who joined today and asked so many really wonderful questions that got us thinking about how we need to communicate the, this all this information to you guys. Just wanted to um, 
uh, echo and Zena on the importance that we want to support you all as creative as, as artists, um, that we are here to assist you with anything that you need. Uh, we understand this is a very competitive, very vulnerable process. And uh, by reframing it in a way to help yourself, to help yourself understand yourself better, um, copy and paste that artist statement into another grant application. Uh, so this really opens up the opportunity to apply for other grants and um, other funding, residency, et cetera, because you will have to continue talking about your work. And um, just take care of yourselves, especially now. Um, thank you all for coming and, and staying here for two and a half hours and letting us talk with you all. And um, definitely get some water, get a little snack, um, take care of yourself, watch some Netflix, and uh, have a great rest of your evening.